the lies that get made up during a campaign are insane. Through this last year, I've had the following claims made by my opponents and their proxies. Um, that one of my kids is trans, that my wife is a witch, um, that we're secretly in some secret society, that, I, I mean, it just gets crazier and crazier. And what's funny though, is I mean, it's never about policy. There hasn't been one criticism on my policies. What's doing everybody? I'm Alec Lace. Thank you for watching First Class Fatherhood. Today's guest on the podcast is Robbie Starbuck. Robbie Starbuck is a former Hollywood filmmaker who is currently running for Congress in the great state of Tennessee. There are people trying to prevent him from having his name on the ballot. He's going to tell us who and why in just a second here. He is also the author of a new children's book, Putting Pirates and the Problem with Power. It is of the Brave Book series. The link to the book is down there in the show notes. Also down there is the link to my new book, First Class Fatherhood, Advice and Wisdom from High Profile Dads. So get down there, smack the subscribe button, tap the like, and let's jump into it right now with Robbie Starbuck on First Class Fatherhood. Joining me now, First Class Father, Robbie Starbuck. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, let's start right here. How many kids do you have? How old are they? I've got three kids, 13, 9, and 5. Wow, very cool. Are you all done? Are you going for more? I think we'll probably have one more. I think, you know, I, I, I think we miss having a baby. So maybe at some point, you know, after this crazy election, that might be in the future. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I'm going to jump into that uh, in, in just a second. I got four kids myself, so um, it, it, we got our girl on the fourth try. Otherwise, we'd still be moving, but uh, uh, we got her and that's that. So if you could, Robbie, please take a minute here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Absolutely. So I started out as a director in Hollywood, but in 2016 um, came out and became the crazy, you know, Hollywood open conservative and started talking about, you know, my values and why I was Republican, why I voted Republican. And um, to the dismay of all my clients, you know, I directed Oscar winning actors, actresses, some of the biggest music stars. Um, I refused to shut up about it. I just said, you know, if they can do it, you know, why can't I? Um, they talk about politics all the time. I should be able to as well. Um, and I knew there'd be a hit with that. And we took a big business hit over me doing it, but it was the right thing to do. And, you know, for me, my family came from Cuba. And so I feel this great duty to stand up and say something and, and you know, sort of live the American dream, which includes that freedom to go and fight for what you believe in. And so whatever the cost of that is, it felt necessary and appropriate to do it. And so then as we get into 2020, I just, you know, kept being upset by the failure of leadership in our country. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to go run for Congress. And um, that's what I've been doing. And we're in a great position here in Tennessee, leading the polls and, um, you know, ready to win this race. Um, now we've been faced with a little bit of a roadblock because some of the establishment here has tried to throw us off the ballot. Um, and so we're fighting that now in federal court and believe we'll be victorious. Yeah, I'm going to jump more into your campaign in just a second here. But if you could, Robbie, take me back then to the beginning of your fatherhood journey. You said your oldest is a teenager now. About how old were you then when you first became a dad? And how did that experience kind of change your perspective on life? Yeah, so I, I mean, I was a teenager myself. I was 19, um, you know, when she was born. And it changed everything for me. I mean, I remember the moment she was born, the whole world changed. You know, I was... I was in that hospital room and when I saw her face and they went to hand her to me, I mean, it's, I'll never forget the moment because everything went into slow motion. I mean, it was just incredible. Everything that you care about, all your priorities, it all changes in that moment. And I think every father can kind of relate to that, that slow motion moment, because it happened with every one of my kids where everything just started moving at like snail pace and you lock that memory in for life. And it was just this, this, you know, sort of duty put upon your shoulders of like, you need to protect this child and you need to provide for it and you need to fight for this child at every turn. This is this is your number one job now, you know? And so um, it changed everything in my life, you know, especially I was a young dad. It, um, it really put the fire under me to succeed in everything I did so that I could provide a better life for my kids. Yeah, very well said, Robbie. And I, I harp on this show all the time about the fatherless crisis that we have going on in our country. We got so many kids growing up without a father or father figure. The nuclear family unit has been under attack. It's been destroyed. And I believe it to be the result of, of what we're seeing in our country take place as far as crime, poverty, drug use, teenage pregnancy, suicide, the whole bit. I mean, it just seems like if we could just focus on strengthening our family units in this country, I think so many of these issues that we're facing would start to just go away on their own. What, what's your take? Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that, you know, when you look at sort of outcomes in our country for kids, 
the top indicators in terms of success are pretty much aligned to education and parenting. You know, are your parents present? Are you getting a decent education? Those things sort of determine large, large parts of our outcomes in youth. So if you get back to, and this is why I'm a big believer in school choice, because I think with unencumbered, like totally no strings attached school choice, what you're gonna end up with is a future where a lot more people homeschool their kids. And as a result, that means kids are with their parents more. And I think when you do that and you give that sort of flexibility to parents and families, you're also going to see a lot go to religious schools and private schools where the values of the family are reinforced rather than being questioned every day like they are in public indoctrination centers. And so I think that that's a big part of recentering the family and building up the nuclear family again is getting school choice passed. But beyond that, just in general, I mean, especially, you know, I'm Latino, you look at Latinos, you look at black Americans success is predicated largely on father involvement and education and so we've got to make those things a priority especially if we want to grow you know for me i look at things through the lens of my party um, if we want to grow the republican party and be a dominant party that does good for america we've got to make that a priority as part of our platform and reaching out to the latino and black community to say you know what we want to uplift these communities we want to make you know, sort of an environment where there's good jobs, there's there's safety, and that you have everything needed to have more fathers in the home, have better education. Because we're gonna see just, I mean, sea change in things like crime stats, poverty stats, everything else, just general outcomes. We're gonna push people towards the middle class. Yeah, there's no question about that, Robbie. And yeah, at School Choice, I had uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the show a couple of times. He's a big advocate for uh, School Choice as well. And I just think it's a scary time for parents right now, not just because of the education system uh, where here I'm in New Jersey here and in the fall, they're going to start teaching second graders about sexual orientation, uh, which has really just blown my mind here. And it just seems like things like this, uh, I, I can't wrap my head around. And the other part of this here, Robbie, is you, you've thrown your hat into this political arena here, and it's 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 a toxic uh, arena, and and people are coming. It's it just seems like it's a one sided argument every time. It's always against the people on the right. I just did the interview uh, with Dinesh D'Souza, whose two thousand mules is being canceled by everybody. They took my interview with him down off of YouTube. So the the censorship, the cancellation, uh, is, is an onslaught against the right side of this whole thing. What has been your experience here since you you know ranch began your campaign here to run for Congress? And what has been the response from your family? How has it affected your wife, your kids, the whole bit? So there's multiple. This is going to be a long answer. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with the tech censorship first. So right after I announced I was running for Congress, I did CPAC. Um, that's where I announced that. And in my speech, I said, in no uncertain terms, I said their names, the CEOs of the big tech companies. And I went through a, an order of them and said, we're coming. In 2022, a wave of lions are coming to correct course here and to make sure you cannot censor the American people anymore. And literally within 48 hours, Instagram and Twitter did what's called a search ban on my name. So it means that if you don't already follow me on Twitter or Instagram and you put in Robbie Starbuck, you're not going to see my account unless you're friends with a large number of people who are already friends with me. So they built this into the algorithm. So like to try to not create suspicion. But for 90 percent of people, they search my name. They can't find me. You just see fan accounts or maybe my wife's account, but you don't see me. And it's meant to limit the discovery of the candidate. So if somebody sees me on Tucker Carlson or on your podcast and they go, oh, I want to go follow this guy on social media, they're not going to go through extraordinary lengths to get to my account. You know, they're going to search the name. They don't see it and be like, OK, guess he's not on Twitter. Um, and that's just not the case. So they did that almost immediately. OK. Um, Gmail, I saw Ronnie Jackson, he's a member of Congress from Texas, he tweeted this morning about um, Gmail and how Gmail is limiting Republican candidates' ability to get their emails to their email lists. Absolutely true. So everybody who signed up for my email list, I've never bought lists from other people. It's all people who have signed up because they want to be on my email list. The vast majority of them, especially Gmail accounts, it all goes to spam for no reason. We use all best email practices everything that you could possibly do. We do drip sends, everything, so it doesn't all go out at once. Everything goes to spam still because Gmail has it set up in their sorting algorithm to do this, you know, and they, they refuse to be open about the fact that they're doing this. So this type of political activity from limiting my ability when they don't do it to other candidates in the race, and then the same thing when it comes to the mail side of it, this is essentially, it's election interference, you know, which is funny because these are the same people who cry about election interference on other things. But when it comes to this, 
they see no problem with it. I mean, because it's really, this is an in-kind donation beyond the allowable limits to my opponents because it, they don't do the same thing to the people running against me, even on the Republican side. So on both sides, you know, they're kind of picking out, okay, this is a dangerous candidate. Let's make sure we censor them. And so that's something people should be very concerned about. But in terms of how it affects, you know, family and everything else, what we've been through during this race is why good people don't run for, for office, okay? It's why good people go like, you know what? I just want nothing to do with that. Um, thankfully, I have very thick skin, but I mean, the lies that get made up during a campaign are insane. Through this last year, I've had the following claims made by my opponents and their proxies. Um, that one of my kids is trans, that my wife is a witch, um, that we're secretly in some secret society, that, I, I mean, it just gets crazier and crazier. And what's funny, though, is, I mean, it's never about policy. There hasn't been one criticism on my policies because they know I'm, I'm a conservative populist. My policies are all broadly very popular. And so they can't go there. So what do they, they just make stuff up, you know, and for good people, they don't want stuff like that made up about their kids. I mean, it's, it infuriates you, you know, obviously none of my kids are trans. Um, I've been very outspoken about the dangers of this, you know, trans agenda of trying to transition children. Um, this is just like something that they made up because they think that some people will be crazy enough to believe it. And, you know, what's sad is some of the people who come up and they, they ask the question, they're good people, but they just, they've been sold a lie and they come up and they ask the question. You have to explain to them like, no, this is ludicrous. This is the stuff they do. And they did this to Trump, to be fair. I mean, they do this to candidates who are outside the system, who are going to shake it. And, um, you know, I think that it's why we need good people to just be willing to weather the storm and do it, because if we don't do it, this system's never going to change. You know, it's why I'm doing the federal lawsuit I'm doing right now, because they're trying on every front to get rid of me. And it's just like, you know, they'll hit their head over the wall a million times to try to get rid of us, because the truth is you get real people in there who have real priorities and are not beholden to, you know, all the lobbyists and special interests their system crumbles and they're very aware of that. They're acutely aware, especially people who can talk and can get a message across. They really don't want those people because that means you're gonna help elect other people. And those people are gonna replace the people in power now. And they don't want that. Yeah, they're obviously very protective of it too, Robbie. So uh, I, I, I got a lot of respect for you for doing it. I, I, I can only imagine the toll it does take personally on you guys. I mean, and you're right. That's why so many people that would otherwise be great leaders for this country would never even consider doing it because of that, what they would have to go through. And, and to the point with the whole trans, I, I found it interesting that since the Supreme Court leak, uh, it seems like everybody who was the big advocate on the left that told you men could have that they dropped the trans community like a wet banana all of a sudden. Like it was all of a sudden it was a women's rights issue and only women could have pregnant. The, like yeah. the, the, the poor now little men can't uh, get pregnant anymore. Yeah, the, the poor <laughs> little uh, pregnant man emoji didn't even stand a chance last week. Like, it, you know, he went out the window. But uh, get, getting into this whole thing with the school and teaching the trans or, or just teaching anything sexually related. I have a second grader in, Jer in Jersey, my youngest here, and it's the thought of them sitting Sitting down an adult talking to a seven-year-old about anything sexually related. I think we should all be uh, storming in front of the, the courthouse uh, protesting this or where the school board and said, uh, because this is this is disgraceful what's going on. And that's why I love what the Brave Books series has brought uh, to this, because it's giving this wholesome value, uh, educational type of stories to the kids. And I love what they're doing. You've got a new book here in the series, uh, Put in Pirates and the Problem with Power. Uh, what could you tell the listeners about the book and uh, what is the main message that the kids are going to get from it? Yeah, I mean, this is it's what Brave Books is doing. It's filling a gigantic need in culture because the problem is our kids are being inundated with messages from every segment of culture, from TV, academia, you know, music, books all around, basically pushing leftism on them. I mean, you even see places like Target now. OK, Target is selling chest binders and you know, um, stuffing for the underwear to try to push on kids and getting like trans toddler t-shirts. It's lunacy on every front. And so having companies like Brave Books create content that reinforces our values is priceless. So with my book here, I'll grab it and show people. Um, this is the book, oh, that's upside down, there we go. Um, it's just, it's, it's delivering the type of content kids are used to, but with high quality illustrations and sort of superhero type of message that kids just really connect with, but it's reinforcing our values. So in the case of my book, it's about the importance of the constitution, which is called freedom's law in the book, and how dangerous it is when authoritarians rise to power and try to change or steal or undermine that, that basis, whether it's the constitution or freedom's law. 
and how that produces really terrible outcomes. And so they see that in real time and then see the heroic nature of the, the Brave team, the Brave squad, um, which is all of these cute, amazing superhero animals who go and they fight for freedom and they fight to make sure that Freedom's Island stays a place where they have Freedom's Law, which is their constitution. And they see in real time, like what a difference that makes in their lives. But one of the things I love the most about Brave Books is in the back of them, they have this, um, this section that's for families. It's essentially the Brave Challenges. And so they're like games and challenges that you do with your kids, where you go through sort of a thought process that allows the kid themselves to think on their own and come up with natural outcomes and solutions and ideas that leads them to find on their own that the best outcomes and um, you know sort of decisions they could make are ones that are in alignment with the values you're trying to you know give to your kids. So in our case, you know, it, it one of the challenges sort of produces this game where you have to play a game by somebody else's rules and then by your own rules and then by no rules and then shared rules and you see sort of where the best outcomes are and then ultimately you see that doing it the way where you know it had been agreed upon by by everybody was the best way to do it and um and that was something that that was you know sort of the fairest outcomes and so it's sort of you know you tie in a lot of the constitutional nature and language to it in a kid's way that is friendly and they can read and connect with on their own but it produces so much goodness for families because families get to have fun doing those challenges together. Yeah. Well, I'm going to drop a link in the description of this podcast episode to the book. I I, I really love what, what Brave Books does. It takes some of these somewhat complex theories, puts them into a simple capsule form for kids to understand in a fun way and an entertaining way. So uh, props to you for being a part of it. And I know you got a lot going on and being able to find the time to do this must be challenging as well. And let me bring it back to you as a father for a minute here, Robbie. What, what type of uh, disciplinarian would you say you are as a dad? And is that different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Yeah, so I'll start with first, one thing I wanted to note about Brave Books, by the way, is we were subscribers before they ever asked me to do a book. So my wife and I, we were already fans of this series because it's a new book every month. And it's just, it's incredible fun for our family and it's made us all closer. Um, so I wanted to note that. And then also that they refuse to sell on Amazon. So you have to go to bravebooks.com for it because Amazon, they don't want to give any more money to Jeff Bezos. And I, I respect that so much because they could be making way more money by selling on Amazon. But they say, nope, we're not giving more money to Jeff Bezos or Amazon. We're going to do this on our own. Um, and so they're an incredible company. But in terms of discipline, um, very different than the discipline I grew up with. Um, you know, I had a challenging relationship with my dad my dad unfortunately had a lot of mental health issues and so um i had a very a kind of brutal upbringing when it comes to discipline um and you know that's something that i feel like any any grown men if you've had that sort of relationship with your dad and you had that experience um it's important as an adult to be able to move past it and forgive for whatever happened you know and i think that's something that i'm really proud of is that you know i've totally forgiven my dad he had a very hard life he was raised in a very difficult way and you know he didn't know anything else that's all he knew and so it was difficult for him but i will say this one of the advantages of the way i grew up is that i learned in real time what not to do and so and i think that's kind of the way it can go you can either repeat a cycle or you can learn by watching and saying, I never am gonna do any of these things. And so in terms of discipline with my kids, you know, it kind of depends, they're all different ages, so they all get sort of different things. But um, one of the things that's been super effective for us is just making sure that you actually go through things with them and talk with them in depth about it. Because for my kids, especially my oldest, she's very intellectual. You talk her through an issue, that really is what gets her. Because if she has no escape in the conversation and no way to really debate, and you get her to the point where she just realizes I'm totally wrong. That in itself and sort of the, the disappointment she feels, that's enough for her. You know, that's enough on its own to produce the outcome you want. With our son, it's more about, you know, things that he wants to do. You take away those things he wants to do and suddenly he whips into shape really fast. So if you take away all the things that he just he wants to spend his time on and you say, nope, you can't do any of those things anymore. You know what? You get to do these extra chores and do this and this and this. That sets him on the right path really fast. Um, and then with the youngest, you know, it's always harder with the younger ones because um, it, it, you have to get more creative. And so with her, you know, it's more so utilizing the the timeouts and everything else that are appropriate at the time range. And that in itself kind of drives her nuts, but also taking away dessert. That with her is a big deal. She wants her dessert and she can't have her dessert. She's very upset about that. So she'll put on her best face and best behavior to make sure she earns that dessert. 
Yeah, I got one of those as well. Really good stuff, Robbie. And um, so you got a lot going on. The campaign going for Congress, the book coming out or the book out now. Uh, what, what is uh, what is it? Father's Day is around the corner here. What does the perfect Father's Day look like for you? What's the best way for you to spend your Father's Day? Honestly, at home, you know, I'm, I'm um, you know, it's, I have to camp- campaign all the time. So I'm always out at events and doing stuff. Um, I really treasure that time at home with the kids and my wife. And so Father's Day, I kind of just want to be at home with my kids and get to play games with them outside, you know, have lunch as a family, have a little picnic or something, have dinner together, you know, get to just make the day games and fun, you know, and that's kind of what we always do. And usually it's like one of the few days of the year where I sleep a long time because I normally only sleep about four hours a night. So when it gets to Father's Day, I'm like, you know what, I'm taking a long sleep and I'll sleep like 10 hours that day. Um, So I get to sleep in pretty late and then we just have a lot of fun all day. Very cool. All right, Robbie, last thing I want to hit you with here. I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? Fear is normal. Fear is very normal. And I think that that's something that a lot of new dads feel, especially if you're a younger dad. But I think just all dads feel that initial fear about, you know, so many things, keeping your kids safe, providing for them, doing the right thing by them. Are you are you doing the right thing, you know, in terms of discipline? And they've got to understand every kid is different. So what's working for somebody who's trying to give you advice is not necessarily going to work for your kid. And it doesn't mean your kid's broken or you're a bad dad. Um, you've got to you've got to understand it's going to take time to get into a groove of what works for each kid, you know. And um, they really are. When people say every kid's different, they really are very different. Like our three kids, they are nothing alike in any way. I mean, they are such different personalities. You have to deal with them all differently. And so sometimes the best advice is toss all the advice out the window that you got. You know, you've got there's no handbook to this. You've got to just experience life, find out what works for your kid and trust yourself and trust your partner, too. You guys got to do it together. I, I got to say, as a dad, what's made me a better dad is that my wife's got my back all the time. Have a standing rule together as parents that you never undermine each other when it comes to your parenting. It's it's so critical with kids that they're getting a consistent message from their parents. Even if you're divorced or you're separated or whatever the deal is, try your best to come to some sort of agreement with the other parent and make sure that you're on the same page where you don't undermine each other because good outcomes are consistent outcomes. And the kids got to be able to count on consistency from their parents that they're going to get the same sort of thing, whether it's coming from mom or dad, because the worst thing you can have is a relationship with your kid where you say no because it's the right thing. And then you can get undermined immediately by somebody else who's saying yes. And they turn right around and ask the other parent and get a yes and get the opposite reaction. That's terrible for kids. It's terrible for the parents and it leads to bad outcomes. So just know that. And sometimes it's not easy to do that and be consistent because sometimes you might disagree with how the other parent handled it, but you still on the front facing side of it need to back up the other person and then privately have a conversation with the other parent about why you disagreed with it so that you guys could maybe handle it differently in the future if if she sees or he sees the logic and kind of how you're handling it. Um, But I think that's super important to to just the whole thing is make sure you're on the same page with with the other parent. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. This has been a lot of fun for me. I got to say, Robbie Starbuck, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you. Absolutely. Anytime you want me on, I'll be there. You've got a great, great show. And I think it's so necessary for dads to have their own thing, you know, and uh, we've got to empower dads, strengthen what it means to be a father again. Being a father is an honor and we've got to treat it that way and be the strong men that our families need us to be and be the leaders that our kids need us to be so badly. That's how our nation's going to get saved. No matter what side you're on politically, be a strong dad, be a leader. That's what our kids deserve. Yeah, right on with that, Robbie. Thank you so much.